I request Dr. Badri to the brief on the rest of the five chapters. Respected sirs, um, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I'm facing two difficulties here, Sunday afternoon and uh, post-lunch alkaline tide. So let me be a little bit informal in between. So to start with the CQA chapter, as you can see, there is one standard more and two objective elements. The first one is the stress on innovation. The quality improvement program promotes and demonstrates use of innovation. So what is innovation? It is a meaningful change. It is taking intelligent risk. It is minimal input to get maximum output. As we saw through many presentations today and yesterday, there were many examples of innovations. Unless we innovate our processes and our uh, both the patient care as well as the managerial processes, we can't get the maximum efficiency and the output. So there is a focus on innovation. Then improve KAP of nursing care. KAP is knowledge attitude and practice, overall the quality of nursing care. So it was there earlier also, now the specific examples have been given. Now we can elaborate on these examples and much more than these examples we need to do. Injection practices or medication administration, awareness about HIC. So it could be done in the form of a questionnaire, whether a nurse is aware about it, or it could be the observation, whether they are practicing it, or it could be the attitude, whether even after knowing how to do, whether they do it or not. Then there are some new indicators, intraoperative change in the surgical plan. Earlier there was modification of anesthesia plan. Why only anesthesia, why surgeon should feel bad or why anesthesia should feel bad. So there is one more indication of change in surgical plan intraoperatively that has to be captured. In addition to VAP, VAE, ventilator associated events, which could be the uh, injury to the lungs, and other injuries, intubation trauma to stenosis, anything could be captured. There have been new indicators on the patient safety goals. Earlier patient safety goals were mentioned, but new indicators were as such available, I mean, were not made mandatory. Now the effectiveness of handing over. Now it could be done in different level, it is left to the imagination of the hospital to some extent, but there is an indicator, the formula is given. So whether the person who is giving the handover, they know how to do the handover. Maybe based on a structure tool. Example of ISBAR has been given in uh, probably the PRE chapter and the AAC chapter. So whether it is they know how to do it or whether it is done looking at the documentation part of it and whether the attitude part of it. Then the incidence of patient identification errors. So in any hospital, probably in our hospital, there will be five Lakshmis in the female ward and five Narayanas in the male ward. So errors do happen, capture the incidence of these errors. Then complaints to hand hygiene practice, five moments of hand hygiene, already it was there, but now it is made an indicator. Complaints to medication prescription in capitals, it has been uh, told by Dr. Basil. So it is possible, uh, we tried it out, but we are facing a new challenge now. Now we are 90% compliant with the writing in capitals, but the capitals have become illegible now. That is the new challenge. So the next important thing is minimum of four new patient care focused indicators and po four process related indicators. One more thing I forgot, one more four new clinical audits that has come into the picture, four, four, four. That is the key word here is not four, minimum is the word. So more than four it is expected, minimum is four. So many examples are there. Yesterday in uh, morning presentation, Dr. Sibyl presented 25 clinical outcomes are being captured at Apollo. Probably all of us have to reach to that level and to beyond that level to start with. These are some examples. <coughs> then in the data collection, uh, as you told, the new standard has been made about data collection and analysis. So if the collected data, either the sample is not correct, or the data is not correct, what is the use of that data? And if we form corrective and preventive action based on that data, it is going to be as useless as the data. So there has to be a validation mechanism. So how we have to validate, who has to validate, that needs to be figured out. And analysis using appropriate method that has been stretched. Everything is not fishbone analysis alone. There are many other tools of quality which needs to be appropriately used, then implement, then re-evaluation following implementation. 
So there is, it is not just data collection, whatever the implementation, whatever the changes we have made, how much of this data has changed because of this implementation that we need to measure so that we know whether whatever we did was useful or not. Then all this, if it remains only with the quality office and with the top management or a few seniors, there is no use. It has to reach to the stakeholders. Then only at the grassroots level, the improvement will happen. That has been stressed. It is said that the bottleneck is in the top. You see any bottle in front of you, it is always in the top. So the organization and the department leaders are aware of the quality improvement program. If they know and if they can contribute to quality improvement program, then the organization will move faster and higher, closer and stronger. So that has been stressed here. Then let us learn from others' mistake. Whenever an incident happens, a near miss or an adverse or a sentinel event, the people who pass through that incident or who are a witness or in which area it happens, those people know what has happened and how to prevent it probably. But if it happens in uh, Ward A, if the Ward B nurses didn't know, it will happen in Ward B next time. So it is important to communicate all this to all the stakeholders, concerned stakeholders that has been put as an objective element. Now going to the ROM chapter, the most important probably at four levels, that is at the hospital level, NABH assessor level, NABH accreditation committee level, and NABH as a whole is the change in this regulatory requirement. So it is, as Dr. Murli told, we are not regulators, but we are encouraging this. But are we diluting the standard? No, we are not diluting the standard. The person, the head of the institution is responsible for compliance with the legal requirements, but there is no compromise on patient or employee safety. Wherever this is there, it has to be completely compliant, but there is definitely more focus on, there is no pr uh, point in having a uh, piece of paper as a license and when people don't know the practices. So that is more focused on. Other major changes in ROM chapter are reports of quality and safety committee are shared by management. Otherwise, it should not work parallelly. So the safety committee has some um, suggestions which does not reach the management and there is no parallel activity and the funds are not allocated. So to connect that, this has been introduced. National public health programs, whether a TB program, mother and child, non-communicable diseases, whatever is applicable, that needs to be stressed on. Then the strategic and operational plans, of course the financial plan, the expansion of clinical services, that will be there, but include patient safety goals also. Our ramp is very slopey. Next time when we are building, we have to change the ramp. If it is only in the safety committee meeting, it doesn't reach the strategic plan. When they are building, they are not going to build it. So it has to be, there has to be a connection between all this. That is the purpose of introduction of this. Now going to the FMS chapter, generally we all have a tendency of let us keep it, maybe someday we may need it. So whether it is our uh, uh, wallet, um, I think my wallet is quite fat, but there is only char rupai bara ana, and all our majority are waste. Similarly, our table, our hospitals, our workplace, our home are filled with unnecessary uh, materials. So it is, there has to be a process for condemnation and disposal in a systematic manner. That is the purpose. So one component of 6S is introduced into uh, NABH. Now this is an era of danger from human beings. So there has to be a process and means to identify staff, visitors and vendors. All of you would have experienced various uh, things in our hospital. A couple of people were staying in our hospital as patient attenders using our general toilets and all that for months together probably we, later on we realized how it how they used, misused us. So there has to be an identification mechanism who has to, who has access where. It is left to the uh, uh, policy of the hospital whether you want to have a tag, whether you want to have a card or various other mechanisms, but that needs to be done. So everything needs maintenance. It is not just the engineering equipments or the biomedical equipments. What about the walls? What about the furniture? What about the chairs and sofas and other things? So those also need maintenance, there has to be a maintenance plan. Doesn't mean that you need to have the highest quality and you need to spend a lot, but there has to be a plan. So this has been discussed in length, reduce, recycle and reuse. Morning we had a presentation from Dr. Bhagat. So there is no specific prescriptive thing, no, you have to use LED bulbs right now. 
It is not like that. You need to demonstrate, the hospitals need to demonstrate that we are moving forward, we are thinking about it and what we have done or what we are going to do in the future. Then we have to measure the measurer. That is the utility equipment. For example, pressure gauges of steam sterilizer or temperature gauges of refrigerators. So with what we are measuring, that needs to be measured. Again, it has to be calibrated. Otherwise, our measurement is not going to be right. So the neural network of a hospital is IT, information technology, the computers, the telephone lines and all that. that there has to be a maintenance plan for that. So not just cars, even equipments are recalled. So you have all heard of recalling of cars, some engine problem, some starter problem and all that. But even equipments get recalled. Mo many of the times we may not know. So with this purpose, this has been introduced as we are running the hospital, we are in the hospital, we are supposed to know when the equipments are recalled. We can put part of the responsibility to the vendors also to inform us. When it has been recalled, it has to be recalled, otherwise it is unsafe for patient use. So how to create the awareness, plan, recall, and SOP is needed. So turnaround time for equipment breakdown response, it's a breakdown to earlier it was a confusion, whether it was the first response was recorded in some hospitals and it is the final repair was recorded. Now at all stages it has to be recorded. So now moving on to HRM. So mainly the training effectiveness. So when, we, when can we call the training is effective? When we see the effect of training in the form of pre-test, post-test and let me talk about pre-test and post-test. Well, many of the hospitals would do post-test, but why pre-test is also necessary and it has been introduced in the objective element is if the pre-test score was 100 and post-test score was 100, probably the training was not needed. If the pre-test score was 20 and post-test was 21, probably the trainer was bad or the content was bad or the method used was wrong. So it is important to recognize both. And all these records of pre-test and post-test and the results and all that, if we are going to have it in the personal records of each of the employee within three years, the file will become 300 pages. So it is not possible to maintain. So it has to be a traceability. You can store it somewhere, but this person has attended this and this training that needs to be there. Then the feedback specifically about the training content, subject, trainer, arrangements, all these can be taken and improvised on because it is a real cruelty to have training where the pe people are not enjoying it. So when even employees deserve confidentiality. So who can access the personal records, HR records? Any junior quality officer, can, can he see the HR record of a CEO? So who can access? What is the SOP for access? And it, it may be, there may be further classified information. There may be disciplinary information and all that. Who can access and how to store it, how to retrieve it has to be a SOP. Now moving to the last chapter, IMS. As you can see, only two ob objective elements have been increased. <coughs> One is the telemedicine, so which is picking up fast and probably by before the next edition of NABH it is going to have a huge change in our industry. So documented policies and procedures to guide telemedicine, SOP, that is who has to do and all the details of it, how we are going to storage, store and retrieval of data and focus on patient identification process confidentiality and all that. So document control. Uh, this was, this is one of the uh, pain points both for the assessor because there was no specific objective element where to put it, the NC, and for the hospital because there was no formal standard so they could not improvise on this to some extent. So the documents have to be current and updated, reviewed, approved, released by authorized personnel, regular updation, identification in the form of a number so that somebody else sh just should not introduce a new uh, document, and then removal of obsolete documents, the retention policy, all this has been addressed. So if you can just read this heading, do PT for this PT after PT is over. So this is the way we use our uh, abbreviations. This means do prothrombin time for this patient after physiotherapy is over. So well, each organization needs to have a policy for usage of abbreviations, whether it is medical, I mean the, the medication abbreviations or non-medication uh, abbreviations, each hospital has a unique form of using the abbreviations, what is accepted and what is not accepted, that needs to be mentioned, it has to be adhered and it has to be analyzed, assessed and improvisation has to happen over that. 
So we told that IT system is our nervous system. What happens if there is a nervous breakdown? So what is the contingency plan to ensure continuity in providing information needs whenever there is a breakdown? It is a major, major, major problem if it happens. So we need to be ready with that plan and we need to be probably have mock drills and or mini mock drills at least to see whether it works. Mock drills is not mentioned in the standard. It's my feeling, that's all. So management centric standards are not really management centric. They're still like planets and patient is the sun. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before